All right. Well, welcome everyone to the uh, afternoon session of the uh, Open Harvard Minicom today. Um, we're running 25 minutes uh, late, so I guess there's nothing to push back, but we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. So, a great pleasure going to um, start off with John Spencer. John was the designer of the Lollybot, um, and now he has 50 of them. <laughs> Up front, it's great. I and, technically uh, only John's, have one. John's been behind a number of the designs for the last uh, for several uh, open hard many comps over the years. So, and he's fine enough, especially today, just to be able to present and see see the pots in action. So, we're cool. running behind. So, John, take it away. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Andy. Um, so. I'm going to try and keep this talk pretty high level. Um, I've got a bunch of different topics I sort of want to cover and they're sort of vaguely connected, but I'm not going to get into anything deep because I find that we tend to just leave people behind a little bit. Um, public speaking is one of my special skills, so you're in for a treat. This is going to be fun. It's going to be rambly, poorly written and poorly timed. So, and the jokes will likely only be funny to me. So let's see how we go. Um, First, I just thought I'd cover with what actually Lollibot is. I haven't really told you what I'm going to be talking about. You're just going to have to come with the ride. Uh, the Lollibot is a ping pong soccer playing robot. Um, at the moment, it doesn't play ping pong yet. So that's exercise for the reader, I guess. Uh, it's run on a Lolan 32 Lite. It has two wheels, six, a six axis accelerometer, a little servo to kick balls around, and it has an IR sensor on the front. Um, I thought I'd introduce the team pretty early before I get lost a little bit. We've got John Oxer, who is missing somewhere. Uh, we've got Andy Gilmy. Um, we've got Angus Grattan, who's not here today, unfortunately, but as ESP32 support agent for our entire team, he does a pretty good job. I've got Nick Moore, who I haven't seen in here yet either, by myself, because I always forget to mention myself. Uh, we've got Thomas helping out, Steve helping out, Carrie helping out, and Jan helping out and other helpers who I have missed. I'm sorry guys, I didn't have a complete list before. Um, the Hack Melbourne guys in Melbourne um, have done a great deal to make this happen as well. Um, just literally the day before we flew up, we had one of our guys come out and do all of the tagging and testing for our equipment. And I'd like to make a special call out to Mark Merlin, not so much for this year's project yet, but for last year's project where he went back and completely wrote all of the firmware we had, and I think that deserves a special mention. Thanks, Mark. What did I talk about next? Ah, the Open Hardware Miniconf. Um, we don't normally talk about what the Open Hardware Miniconf is about. Um, I believe it's the ninth year, although I think the website says eight years. Andy says nine years. Uh, it started as the Arduino Miniconf. Um, and each year we try and design a bit of a custom board that's a bit new, a uh, bit of sort of bleeding edge tech, but is also simple enough that you guys can put it together. Um, on the ninth year thing, I've just realised I do, I've done four years of this, so I'm nearly halfway, which is not a bad effort. Uh, oh yeah, Aunt, John's done all of them, Andy's done a bit over half, I would have thought. So I thought I'd talk also about our design methodology and our timelines for the Open Hardware Miniconf. So in January, we have the conference. Uh, we get very excited because we've finished it, we're through the hump, um, high on success. We have fantastic ideas about what we'll do the next year. Um, we also promise ourselves that we won't leave it so late next time and we will get ahead of the curve. Um, around May-ish, we have a call for papers. We email each other, nothing really happens, maybe some more ideas get thrown around. We also promise that we won't leave it so late and we will stay ahead of this curve. July, there's the deadline-ish for the papers. We actually meet up, we have an idea, we normally sort of vote on it. We relax, a decision has been made, we don't need to worry. We also promise that we won't leave it so late. September, someone remembers that we actually have to do the project. So we design and prototype the idea. October, we spin the hardware and inevitably it does not work. November, we do a second spin and it mostly works. You all have, the, well everyone with the Lollibot has a little IR sensor that doesn't quite fit into the slot that it has provided. December, there's normally a cutoff when we can order components and expect to get them. And the boards normally take a little while. If we have to do any surface mount stuff overseas, that takes probably three to four weeks longer. And then of course, early January, we frantically fix, patch the bits that don't work. We write code, we panic, we do some more panicking. We end up in the pit of despair and Andy has no sleep for days. That's been the last two or three years. 
And then of course, late January, we have a successful event. Everyone is having a great time. We have a, it's a very rewarding experience. Uh, we go home and go back to step one. That's been the last three years that I've done it, and I suspect it's been other years as well. So this year, we made a few design decisions. Uh, the ESP32 chips, they are still great. They have Bluetooth, they have good power saving stuff. Um, now you can actually get dev boards. When we made last year's project, dev boards just didn't exist. Um, at one point, we had 40 of these in a box in the hacker space, and I think it was the, the largest sum of these boards in existence in the entire world. Um, we decided to try and stop shaving yaks a bit. So the idea of yak shaving, of course, is that you want to make a sweater and you end up growing your yak and shaving it. Um, so we've based this year's project on an existing board that already does most of the stuff we want it to do. Um, everyone still seems to like doing a bit of soldering. That's great. And theoretically, the simpler hardware means a better opportunity for software. Um, we did have a bit of gold plating. Uh, we added expansion headers. So they're there if you need some extra pins. We have an IR sensor. Wasn't in the original spec, but it's there now. And we had LEDs. Oh, my, oh there we go. Whee! It spins around. It's great. We had some gold plating that didn't stick, so we did actually throw some stuff out. We didn't just toss everything on. We originally wanted to plan, we, we planned to use a remote control with the E badge. Uh, the E badge was a bit of a bridge too far in the timelines we had, and we actually did get ahead of the ball on that one, which slowed up our production of the Lollibot a little bit, I suspect. Um, maybe next year. We had a boost converter because we wanted to up the amount of voltage to the wheels because more voltage means more speed in this case. Um, that added a lot to the build difficulties, so we, we thought we'd leave that off. And we made another board called the Lolly Wrapper. Um, it plugs into those expansion headers. Uh, the design's complete. Bug John about it. Maybe we'll get some extra ones, but yeah, they should be fun. Ah, control and software. I've only put a little bit here because Andy's going to be doing a big talk about this soon. But MicroPython's really quite mature now. Um, we've, we've been building on stacks that the team, particularly Andy, have already been using. Uh, MQTT is great for rapid prototyping. I have no idea what's going to happen if you all get it running at once. I suspect something will melt. Uh, unfortunately, the Bluetooth on the ESP32 is still a bit flaky, so um, we've left that off for the moment. And that's me finishing talking about the Lollibot. Now, this bit might get a bit weird. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about circuit design because we, we always seem to do that. And I'm sort of introducing something here which I don't think anyone's seen. It's a bit of a new product. I don't know how polished it is. Um, it's a little app. Oh, I've gone up one. It's a little app called Concept CAD. Gives you some idea on how you program stuff, and here you can sort of see you can do some circuit board layout. And by now you should have worked out that this is actually a game. <laughs> so the reason I've included this is because, particularly for me, when I'm doing circuit design, this sort of this is the itch it scratches in my head. I could have been doing this. In fact, I think last year this probably took a few hours out of the design work, playing this particular game. But you could also spend it doing something more produ productive. So I thought I'd show a little bit of a comparison between games and real life. Um, so in the game, you can rate yourself against your friends, which is great, because that one I just showed you there, one of my friends has made his like one power unit smarter than mine, and I have no idea how he did it. Um, virtual circuits are really cheap. If you can do something virtually, it, it saves you a lot of cash, particularly if you're like me and it takes you two or three. Also get fired in your, for your in-game job for spending too much time playing games. And it's actually a really good solitaire game, which doesn't help. On the other side, circuits actually do something. Real circuits actually do something. You might not know exactly what that is until you get it, um, but it will do something. You, if you're building at home, you get to play with chemicals. I don't know if that's a positive or not. That's up to you. Um, and you get an actual circuit to love and to hold. And you can show it off to a whole room of your soon-to-be friends and friends from previous years. So that's a big plus as well. If you actually really want to design stuff, I've been using KiCad for three plus years now. I picked it up at the Hackerspace. I'm not going to dig into it really deep. Um, it's open source. It's fairly mature. It's free as in beer and speech. And it's filled with just as many quirks as every other CAD tool that you're used to using. So you really need to check your, fin your pin footprints because I think 
There's a reason why the plus and the minus on your, your robot feels a bit wrong. Um, that's because the <laughs> it, it, it switched between versions. Oh yes, um, it has a schematic editor, as you'd expect. It has a PCB editor, which is what you take your schematic editor and then you push all the wires around so you get what's in front of you. That's the design you have in front of you. And it's got a lovely little 3D viewer, which, hey, if you're trying to sell something to the rest of the guys that you're, you're working with, that's, that'll get you there. So that was my quick KiCad talk. Now I'm going to go segue again and talk about sort of open hardware in general, in particular how I approach with how I built another project with uh, using KiCad plus other tools to produce an end result that is open and real hard. Well, I say real hardware. That's not right. Like it's got physical elements to it um, beyond just a circuit board, and that is the auto changer. Um, this is a project for my wife's knitting machine, which she's going to be talking about in depth tomorrow. But I'm going to cover the auto changer part here because that's uh, that's something I've spent the last six months on and sort of got held up a little bit with the uh, open hardware conf, but still. You might be asking what that is if you've never seen a knitting machine before. Um, knitting machines, um, when knitting multicolored, there's certain different ways to do it, but a manual device is used to switch between them. You can see here on this video that every pass of this, you have to hit a button. Um, you can automate these machines to a bit with a robotic arm, but you still have to stand there and go click. Click, click. Um, that slows you down. Gives you a nice cadence, but um, it's fairly annoying if you're sitting behind it like I am, because my desk is directly behind that knitting machine. Not that I made that any better. Um, but we can at least make something that moves on its own right. So this is my design, which is not playing. Half a second. This is the first iteration of my design. Servos pushing little levers. Um, I'll dig into this a little bit more and sort of show the different levels I had. That one's powered by uh, just a, an Arduino Uno. Oh, whoops. There we go. First, of course, there's the brains of the unit. I thought I'd go through that independently of the hardware, that the, the physical bit that sits around it. First prototype was an Arduino Uno with a servo shield and a special call out to hot glue because that's 90% of what it's actually made of. Um, the servo shield's really not needed because it only drives four servos. Um, has a beeper that, yeah, like I said, I, I thought the clicker was annoying. I, I was wrong and then I built something that was worse. So that's probably not ideal. But you need a bit of an audio cue to say that you've already gone past the point where you need to change colors. Uh, Prototype 2 was a custom board, an Arduino compatible um, using uh, an Arduino uh, 18 mega 328p and a serial wireless CH340. Um, I did a few spins of that, but I always found it was a, a little bit unreliable, probably due to my own. Well, as a Linux sysadmin, you, you don't really, you don't go to university to study how to make circuits, so sort of stabbing in the dark a little bit maybe. Then I did a prototype 3 which is a custom board. It's, um, it just uses an Arduino Nano that plugs in the bottom. And I found that roughly the pricing for just buying a, a Nano was about the same as buying the CHG340, the AT Mega, the crystals, and all of the extra stuff I needed to make it work, with the added bonus that you could just pull it off and replace it. So that's sort of, I think, how a lot of this sort of circuit board design goes. You, you try things, you find something that works better, and then you just replace. Now, talking about the mechanical bits. I designed it in SketchUp, which, and I used another program called Kanban, which are not open source. Um, they're not, well, they're kind of free. Not really, though. Um, I cut these out on the CTH laser, CTHS laser cutter, which is using Marlin, which is a 3D printer software, and controlled using Pontiface, which are free. And I've released the design free, so I think I get a technical pass on that one. Um, I did about three iterations. This was my first iteration using a lovely SketchUp render. Um, that's how it ended up. It, you might know it looks nothing at all like that render. Um, this render, if you look at those gears, they were great to draw. They looked really fantastic. They are tiny. You, you, you get almost no grip on those. Uh, the laser cutter just went, yeah, that's just a circle. Good luck. Uh, circles don't move levers. So. 
I switch for the, the levers from the servos and, and a bit of pins. Um, and then there's that hot glue I mentioned, which holds it all together. Cable ties. One of the arms was a bit short, so I just extended that out. That, that's why we prototype things. So I moved on to iteration two, uh, which I don't have a design pick for. Um, you see it's got much the same design. There's still these big square purple pieces, which are the arms that move out. The gears, um, much bigger, chunkier, easy to cut on a laser cutter, move about the same speed. Um, the more leverage you get in a gear, obviously the faster it moves, and this was not a bad compromise. Design three, um, minor changes just to improve the construction of it. Um, you see those arms are, are thinner, but there's more mass on the base, which is what actually provides all the strength, the sideways motion. It's easier to assemble. Still uses the same sort of gearing approach. Um, the arms are extended. Little fancy bits like the, the little curve around the end that just helps the, the yarn feed through. And the reason I don't have a physical picture of that one is because this is what it currently looks like sitting on my desk. Uh, that was about the same time as we hit crunch for Open Hardware Miniconf, so maybe one day I'll finish it and it's bordering on becoming a worthwhile project to sell to the other knitting machine knitters that are out there. Um, so what does it actually look like when it's running? I don't think you can hear music on that one, but it's actually fairly annoying how noisy it is, but that's in demo mode and how quickly it can sort of flick between and change. Not that you'd ever be able to move that quickly with the knitting machine. It's got a little infrared sensor at the end which tells when the carriage has moved past. And I'll move to a picture in a second that just sort of shows how that goes. Which is this one. This is the, this is revision two, because obviously I haven't finished revision three. That's with the robotic arm. Um, which you can, which if you're doing that with the manual, you sit there the whole time going click, 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 click. So yeah, moves fairly quickly. Fairly happy with the approach. 15 minutes to go, that's a good call. That's probably not going to happen. <laughs> and those are the needles that move in and out. Um, as I said, my wife's talking about this in more detail tomorrow. She has a lot more videos of how a knitting machine actually works. But I just wanted to run people through this idea of how, how you can take a, an idea um, and push it out into a, a larger design. Um, I will point out that the first time she asked me if I could make something like this for her, I took one look at it and said, oh, there's this big metal arm thing. I've got no chance of doing that. If you just think a little bit closer about how a problem is solved, you, you can actually get a long way with some fairly simple tools. And last, I'm, I'm pretty much done. Thanks for listening. I hope that wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, here's all my links. They're all at the end where it's easy to get to. And like I said, please drop in and see Sarah's talk. Uh, Last time we got, she's got 45 minutes and I think we were down to 52 minutes yesterday, so she might make it under time. Um, thank you for doing the Lollibot project and I think I'm done. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Ah, the heart of Pluto thing. That's, that's just how the branding my wife uses for her all of her kit. Oh, the Heart of Pluto link that's listed there, it's got a lot more in-depth of how I made that arm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, I've, I've really gone in deep on it. things. There's quite a good one there which shows the different revisions between SketchUp um, of the version 1 and the version 1.3, I think I called it, but that's a little bit, yeah. Anyone else? No? Nope. Excellent. Let's learn some MicroPython. Um, we have a quick break where we switch over mics and then Andy will be talking MicroPython. Thank you. Sorry, what was the game that you Oh, the game. That's the, that's the third last link there. Shenzhen IO, it's called. Um, available on Steam. Um, I know nothing, like, it's a puzzle game. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> cool.